Good morning. Good to see you today. Growing up, there was one major, un- unbreakable, unspoken rule in our house. To my knowledge, this rule has never been broken from the time when we were children to now. Both me and my brother. It never, it never had to be said because there was just a sense of what would happen if this rule was broken. And that rule was, you better not insult your mother. In Exodus chapter 20, verses, verse 12, God tells Israel, Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. In my house growing up, and I think me and my brother would still fear this today, if we ever did insult our mother or speak disparagingly about her, the wrath of my father would be such that we would not live long upon the land we've been given. It has never been broken in private. It has never been broken in public. It didn't matter if we were away from home or at home. It didn't matter if we were out with our friends. Somehow, my father's spider sense would go off and we would no longer be here. There are times, as with every child, that there there are times where they're disrespectful, either in tone or action. It even happens with our children. One of the things that that we are learning in our house right now, one of our big pushes is watch your tone and attitude when you speak to mom and dad. This has always been a big push. Sometimes it's easier than others. She knows. <laughs> a major rule in our family as a whole is to treat each other with respect. It's to show each other honor. It's to treat each other well. And here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, when God says, honor your father and mother, this is something that goes beyond mere obedience. This is beyond merely uh, mechanically following the instructions that you've been told to do like a robot. To give honor to your father and mother, I, I researched this a little bit, it literally means to give the weight of honor and glory to them. To treat them with the respect, the glory, the honor, to grant that to them as their God-given right from their children. And I would wager that this this command is for more than than just small children, but that it's for adults as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, starting verse 18, we read, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father and the voice of his mother, and who, even when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of his city. And they will say to the elders of the city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And so unless Israel has a history of, you know, drunken sailor seven-year-olds, these are, at, at the very least, larger children who know better. But adults are bound by this command to honor their father and mother. Even in the New Testament. And we'll touch, we'll touch on children a little bit, but what I really want to focus on today is the adults among us. And in Matthew chapter 15, the first nine verses, Jesus 
reiterates the requirement for children of all ages to honor their father and their mother. And Matthew writes that when the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Jesus answered and said, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. See, the Pharisees had a problem in that they would res dismiss the responsibility they had to um, help and provide for and honor their parents. And they would do this by giving to God what their parents needed, and Jesus calls it evil. He says, you, you're, you're all so hung up on your traditions that you're nullifying God's commands. You say, oh, well, I, I would help you if I hadn't given all this to God. And Jesus calls them hypocrites for it. In fact, I find it interesting that this is the passage where Jesus quotes that these people draw near to me with their mouth and army with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He's, talking, he's referring to how they're treating their parents, how they're dishonoring their parents. In doing so, he shows us that the command to honor your father and mother goes beyond just children. It goes beyond teenagers. But it is, in fact, a command for all of God's people, for all of their parents. And so we have to ask the question today, what does honoring our parents look like? What does that mean for those of us who are alive today? In a world where we have 401ks and pension plans and retirement and everything else, what does that mean? look like? And so for young people, it se this seems like a fairly easy thing to answer. For children, they need to obey and accept their parents' decision. They need to learn what it means to respect and honor them. Hayden's kind of getting to that age. He's, he's 10 now. He's getting to that age where he's starting to want to be, to kind of distance himself a little bit and be more independent. Anyone with children in like the 10 to 13 year range know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> no. <laughs> we never did that as kids, right? We, we never tried to distance ourselves and become our own people, did we? <coughs> but even then, they need to learn what it means to obey and accept their parents' decisions with a good attitude, without arguing against it or trying to debate them out of it. This is one of the things that we deal with now. If you ever follow uh, Danielle's Facebook post she posted the other day, Liam got in trouble, lost his TV privileges. He goes, well, I know I'm, I know I'm grounded from TV, but what do you think about movies? Well, since the movie plays on TV, we're going to say no. <laughs> but they have to learn these things. They have to be taught these things. And with teenagers, it's much the same. It requires obedience and acceptance with a good attitude. And it also requires recognizing your parents' God-given authority over you. 
You remember what it's like to be a teenager, right? I'm my own man. I can do my own thing. What gives you the right? <clears throat> Even though we didn't say it in my household, I'm sure we thought it occasionally. But, but, but the teenage years are a time where we have to start to really learn to understand what it means that God has authority, or that God has given authority to our parents over us. And so we, again, keep learning to obey and accept them with an attitude that shows them the honor that they are due. <clears throat> so now we have to ask, well, what about adults? We're going to show that Jesus requires adults to abide by the command to honor your father and mother. So what does this mean for us? For those who are out of the home, who have started their own families. Oop, we're getting ahead of ourselves. But it does mean, we, you know, recognizing that we are released from, a, from parental authority. <coughs> but we're not released from honoring them and hearing them out. <coughs> my parents come to my house. My father and mother cannot command me to make my bed and mow my lawn. I'm not under their authority in that manner. At the same time, I am bound to honor them and hear them out. Not ignore them or put them off or just set what they have aside because pff, I don't need them. And in our, especially our society today, we really need to ask, can we honor someone by speaking to or about them insultingly or harshly? Our culture really, really, our world today really likes to make light of this, especially with in-laws, right? Oh, you wouldn't believe what my in-laws are like. Just wait. Have I got some stories for you? What an old bat. Oh, he's, he's just ridiculous. He is off the chain. You would not believe what they said. We laugh about it. We have entire movies made around this subject. We have shows made around this subject of being insulting and disparaging to our parents and our in-laws. But fun fact, if we have married someone and become one with them, then their parents are now your parents. And if we're not released from honoring and hearing out our parents, that includes our in-laws. And we cannot honor someone by speaking harshly, insultingly of them. Now, are there times where you may have to vent something to get it off your chest and you're speaking in private with someone trying to figure out how to move forward with them? I think we can make a case for this. But there's a vast difference between that and just brazenly insulting and speaking harshly about them. We also have to, have to ask the question, can we dishonor someone by dismissing their needs, whatever they may be. Can you? Can you honor a person by dismissing a need that they have requested of you just out of hand? I don't believe that we can. In 1 Timothy 5, Eight. This is a big deal, and I want, I, want, I want to make sure I give the context here. Paul is writing to Timothy about how, to, um, how the church is to take care of the widows of the church. So that's, that's where this is coming out of. We're actually going to start in verse 4. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home, 
and repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. We'll go down to verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I would say that it's a big deal when Paul writes saying, if you don't do this, you're worse than an unbeliever and you've denied the faith. I would say that's a big flashing neon sign that we need to pay attention to this subject. Now, like I said, in this context, he's speaking about widows, and widows at this time literally had no way to take care of themselves. And so it was first up to the family and then up to the church. But does the principle not hold true that if we as God's people today dismiss the emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical needs of our parents that we are dishonoring them and not providing for what they need. Does the principle not hold true? I would wager that it does. And so, we may may have some people here saying, but you don't understand. (coughs) You don't understand how I grew up. You don't understand what my parents were like. You don't understand what my parents did to me. At which point I will acquiesce and say, you're right, I don't. I basically grew up in the Partridge family. I've said it before, I'll say it again. But, there are those out there that for some this will be a cross that they have to bear in order to follow Jesus. Jesus often, often calls us to obey him in things that are difficult to do. But I wonder if perhaps that Colossians 3, 22 through 25 could not be of some help to us here. And this is very, very similar to the scripture reading we read earlier. Where Paul writes to the Colossians saying, Slaves in all things be obedient to your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he's done, and there is no partiality. In the Roman world, there was widespread slavery. A great percentage of the population, in fact, were slaves. Not all of them were kind. Not all of them were nice. And yet Paul says, don't just be eye-pleasers in your service to them, but honor God. He doesn't say, hey, if your master is nice, or if your master is kind to you, all he says is, do your service as if it's to please and honor God. He also says, whatever you do, do it as to God and not to people in the first place. He's telling his slaves who have masters above them who have an obligation to do what they're told or else they could be beaten or killed at will to do their, to do what they do as to God rather than people knowing that they would receive the reward of the inheritance because they served Christ. And here's where I think it all comes together for this subject. Whatever they do, they do it, do it to honor, in honor to God, to serve God well. And in the end, they would receive the reward of the inheritance because in reality, they served Christ, not man. And so when we say, well, you don't understand, my parents were fill in the blank, we have to turn to Colossians and say, well, how can this work then? Or turn to Ephesians like we read earlier and ask, how can the, how does, what does this look like for us? And I'm not saying that it will be easy or simple. 
In fact, it will probably be very much the opposite. But in another place, Paul writes, telling women who have unbelieving husbands to submit to and honor them in a godly way. And, and he says, who knows? By your actions and godly conduct, you may win your husband over to Christ. Again, I believe we can draw that principle over to here. What if by your good and godly conduct, you can win them to Christ? You can win them to goodness and righteousness and truth. Like I said, it's not something that's easy. It's not, it's not going to happen overnight. In fact, it will be, probably be filled with a lot of difficulty and heartache. I understand that. But the command is simply honor your father and mother. Because this is the will of God and we should do so as honoring Him above all else. And our goal, our duty as Christians is to let us reflect the light of Jesus in every stage of life. Whether we're children or teens or adults, in every part of life, even, even in honoring our parents and even in difficult and trying situations. If the light of Jesus is shining through us, there's no telling what may happen. And so as we go forward this week, let us be those who honor Jesus and shine His light by honoring and giving glory to our parents as God has deemed appropriate. And let us do that no matter where we find ourselves in. If it's hard, let us turn to Jesus. Let's turn to the Spirit who strengthens us. Let, let us follow Him in all things and reflect His light in every part of life. And let's do that now as we stand as we sing.